about the colour red. We had such a variety when I looked at your lectures, I think you cover every colour. And I really wanted to come back and talk about yellow and blue and everything else. But tonight, <laughs> it's red. It's definitely the, the perfect venue for red, isn't it? I mean, red everywhere, red, even red plastic seats, let alone all the wonderful red in this museum. And I think there are four ladies in red tonight, or maybe even scarlet women, we don't know. But so that's, that's good fun. And because red is such a powerful colour, when I look out over an audience like this, I really only notice the people in red. I mean, I'm sorry, everyone else just disappears into sort of anonymity, but the red people really stand out. And red, yeah, red is such a powerful colour. And it has so many kind of connotations to it as well. I'll just read a few red phrases um, in the English language, which sums it up quite well, actually. Red rag to a bull. Seeing red. The red light district. Redneck. The red carpet treatment. Red hat, no knickers. I was told that one after I did this lecture in Nottingham for some reason. <laughs> Um, the red apple and better dead than red. That's a US phrase from the Cold War. And crossing the Red Sea, which represents a very dangerous thing that you're about to undertake in life. So there we have anger and sexuality, passion, really. And when I was first asked to do a lecture on red, I just kind of, I didn't read any books about it. I just sat down and thought, well, what does it mean to me? And the first thing I thought of, well, it's the colour of passion. And then, well, why is it the colour of passion? And the two most obvious sort of associations I can think of is blood and fire. And so, of course, when you fall in love, when you feel passionate towards somebody, your blood is on fire. It's as simple as that. There is that phrase, isn't it? Your blood is on fire. And so the great thing about red being the colour of passion it's both a negative and a creative colour. You know, passion can be very creative, but it can also be very, very destructive. So red, depending on how it's used by artists, depending on the context, of course, it tends to go into one or other of those um, feelings. And then, of course, heat, the heat of fire and also the danger of fire. So we have both the kind of violence attached to red, but also the quality of transformation both personal and on a social level, it's a colour of revolution as well. So it's, it's obviously a very, very powerful colour. In terms of colour culture, so in Christianity, red is the colour of sacrifice because of the sacrifice that Christ made, the, you know, the violence, the torture, the blood. So that's where it comes from. In, in India, in Hinduism, women get married. Once, sorry, once they are married, they always have the red line down there parting in their hair to symbolize that they are a married lady. And in, in yoga, um, if you follow yoga and you believe in the chakra system, the energy system traveling down your spine, centers of energy, the base chakra in the genital area is always symbolized by red. And then in Taoism, red is the colour of eternity. And then in Chinese culture, it's the colour of good luck and prosperity. Whoops, this isn't working. Uh, remote control? Sorry. Oh, great. Well, I didn't turn it on. Sorry. Good point. Right. So here we have the Scarlet Woman, just a, a Times magazine cover from 2002. And here we have you know, a ravishingly beautiful, sexy woman. She's actually the daughter of Mick Jagger and Jerry Hall. And in a way, Mick Jagger is the male version of the Scarlet Woman, isn't he? He's, he's aggressive, he's quite ang angry, he's full of energy, he's anti-establishment, he's very sexy. So you could say, yeah, he is a sort of male, scar he's a Scarlet male, if you like. And so if you see a woman like that at a party, you know straight away you know, what she's expressing. It's all about sexual power. And red is very much the colour of power, uh, different types of power. So kings and queens wear red, the aristocracy wears red, generals wear red, and judges wear red. And of course, cardinals as well wear, wear red. 
So clothing carries you know, social and economic and moral implications to it. I mean, not nearly so much nowadays, because you know, to dye clothes, to, go, to dye material is, is very cheap, whereas in the old days, before they invented synthetic dyes, you know, colours were incredibly expensive. So red was the most expensive colour to dye, because it was very, very difficult to do. And actually, the word scarlet comes from, it was the name given to red cloth. It was called scarlet, uh, most expensive material. <coughs> but of course, it all depends on context, how you look at a woman in red. We obviously don't have a scarlet woman here. We have the Madonna, the Madonna of the Rose <coughs> Bower from 1473, and it's by a German artist called Martin Schongauer, and it's in the Colmar Museum near Strasbourg. So in this painting, a beautiful image, you've got Mary looking away from us, embracing baby Jesus, who looks out at us, and you've got this beautiful sort of network of arms, his arm around her neck, then his arm here, and then her arm, and very elegant, beautiful composition. And then this great sort of pyramid of her red dress. And you probably normally think of Mary wearing blue, but she was allowed to wear red at, at the Annunciation and when she's a young mother, because it was actually the, the Catholic Church laid down rules for artists that went back to 431 AD, the Council of Ephesus. They basically sort of color-coded the saints. And so if you're an artist, red was reserved for Christ and Mary, either as a Madonna um, or at the Annunciation. So in this image, she's sitting on this grassy bank with, with two beautiful roses, a white rose and a red rose behind her. And she was associated with the rose. She was called the rose without thorns. And so in this painting, the red rose is symbolic of what's going to happen to her baby, the crucifixion. And the white rose represents her purity. Then there's a halo around her head, which in Latin says, pick me also for your child, O Holy Virgin. So this is a devotional painting. You would go to it to have some sort of intimate relationship with Mary and feel that you were being protected in the same way that she's loving her son. And then at the top of the picture, you've got two angels who are luring a crown to crown her the Queen of Heaven. And here's just two little details. You can see how you're know, really observing the natural world um, in this art. So the German and Northern European artists at this time were very much interested in looking at nature and representing nature realistically, which was unlike the Italian Renaissance artists at this time. It was much more kind of generalized for them. So you've got little wild strawberries here. And then, of course, you've got definitely you've got a robin and a chaffinch straight away. You can identify them straight away. And actually, in, in, in nature, in a way, red has a similar sort of significance to what I said at the beginning of the lecture, because, for instance, with the robin, in, in England, the robin's breast gets redder and redder the closer it gets to spring. From Christmas time onwards, it gets redder to attract a mate, just as its song gets more and more tuneful to attract a mate. Uh, <clears throat> It also happens, I think, with, the, with salmon, when they swim upstream back, back to where they came from to fertilize the eggs, they turn from a sort of gray color to a pinky orange color. This is a painting by the Italian artist Bronzino. And I saw this on display at the great exhibition uh, last year of Charles I's art collection. And Wow, what a painting. It really, you know, such a powerful painting. And a lot of the power comes through that very striking contrast of the red and the green. So as soon as you put opposites together, they kind of create a dramatic impact on the eye. So the reason why they're opposites is that in that green, there is no red and vice versa. In that red, there is no blue and yellow. It's a pure red. It's not, if it, it had been more of an orangey red, then it's obviously not a direct contrast because it's got a bit of yellow in it, and, and there's yellow in the green. So when you have a direct contrast, it's a very kind of striking opposition there. 
And, and then with just the whole kind of, the, the way she fills the whole picture as well, it's very powerful presence. It's quite unusual to fill the whole frame like that. With her head just sort of slight tilt as she looks directly at us. She's obviously an extremely wealthy lady here. You know, this beautiful dress, the, the white shirt, the gathered shirt smock, with smocking underneath this green dress with those amazing sort of puffed sleeves. So very, very wealthy lady. This painting is in the National Gallery in London, and it's by a less known artist, but probably one of the great portraitists called Moroni. And he, he was born in Bergamo in northern Italy. And he was a contemporary of Titian. So this is just called Portrait of a Lady from 1550. And so in this painting, he hasn't gone for direct contrast, has he? It's not about that opposition. It's more about the kind of subtle shade, different shades within the reds, oranges, and yellows. And then putting this fascinating kind of gray behind those, those pinks and oranges, which is a really interesting kind of color combination, I think. And the actual color of the dress, it's one of those colors that you, you can't name. You know, it's such an, a fascinating color, and that's why it really held my attention, this painting. What is that color? And how on earth would I mix that color if I wanted to make it? It's very, very difficult. Whereas the previous picture, you, you, you can name those colors compared to this. So he's really interested in painting the, the light being reflected off that silk, silk and satin. That's what he's really interested in. So you've got the, 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 the kind of pinky silk for the outer garment, and then there's an inner garment of that golden, golden orange and a, a silk again. And then there's another layer of dress underneath that, where you've got the white um, material coming through the sleeves. It's been slit, so you can get the, 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 the... So there's three layers of garment there. So again, extremely wealthy woman to have such a dress such as this. So with this color, this is probably a color called carmine. And the origins of carmine are interesting because when the Spanish arrived in Latin America, they discovered all these wonderful red textiles of the Incas and the Aztecs. And the source of this red <coughs> dye came from a beetle, which we now call the cochineal beetle. And these beetles, they feed on pr prickly pear cacti. And after they've laid their eggs, they're then kind of sucked up. It's still, it's still an industry today. They're sucked up by vast, great sort of like hoovers or whatever. And then, you know, ground up into a paste. And the resulting liquid becomes cochineal, becomes the dye, the red dye. And it's used in our makeup industry, our lipsticks and our blushes and, 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 and other things as well. So the Spanish took control of this pigment. They had a kind of monopoly of it. And it was a very, very valuable thing to, you know, to control. And so Venetian artists would use, you know, would use this pigment and then it would you know, make its way across Northern Europe, etc. cetera. Um, so <clears throat> still, it's still made, manufactured today in Peru and in, in Chile. When we move into the 18th century, you see smaller, more intimate scale paintings compared to the Baroque huge grand Baroque paintings, smaller, more small scale. And you see a lot of pastel colors, pastel pinks and pastel blues. These were kind of favorite color, very fashionable colors. And Gainsborough is a master of these, of these pastel shades. And these are two paintings by Thomas Gainsborough. Um, the one on the left is from 1763. She's called Mary Countess Howe. And it's a full size picture. It's, it's two and a half meters high. It's in Kenwood House. And it was a, re it's, well, it is still part of a pair. The other one is of her husband, but he's not wearing pink or red, so I haven't put that in. <laughs> but it's a delightful image. It's a classic Gainsborough image with a woman walking through the countryside. This was very important to express her sort of gentle and sensitive sensibility. She's kind of communing with nature. Um, she's got a refined sensibility. And, and you can see this lovely sort of pink um, skirt with the kind of lacy apron over the top of it. And you can see, if you look at the brush strokes, they're quite sort of 
you can actually identify individual brush strokes. So it's a very loose technique that he really developed that was quite different to any other artist of the day. And just the way he paints the landscape connected to the figure, he brings in the colors of the background into the material. So for instance, over here, he brings in the light from the sunset into the lace sleeves. Again, here he takes these same shades into the background. So all the time, he's creating kind of harmony between her and the surrounding. A beautiful technician, I think. Then on the, the right picture, she's called Mrs. Sheridan Brinsley. And um, again, it's, it's just over two meters high, so it's a pretty big picture. And she was, she was actually, originally, she was called Elizabeth Ann Linley. And she was a very talented musician and singer and was establishing, a, you know, she had a big reputation in London and Bath. And that, but sadly, when she got married, he insisted she give up her career because it didn't look good for the status of a gentleman. So she gave it up. And then, sadly, she died from TB when she was just 38 years old. But she was a great friend of Gainsborough. And I think you can tell that in this image. It's a delightful image. So pink gives off kind of different vibrations to pure red. It's a much more kind of gentle, softer. Um, it's almost like the kind of power of pure red has been softened and sensitized compared to, you know, compared to the, the power of pure red. But then when we go into the 20th century, you see a lot of red, and, pretty, and a lot of pure red or scarlet red. And um, a lot of these artists, particularly in Germany, they, you know, they were rejecting all these sort of the traditions of, of sophistication and culture in art. And they were, wanted to get back to express something really primitive and basic, kind of a primal energy in their work. And so red really expresses that kind of energy. And one of these artists is Otto Dix, working in Berlin. And these are two portraits by him. Uh, the one on the left, she's called Sylvia von Harden. And she was a journalist and a poet and a kind of fashionable woman at the time. And he used to kind of meet her in cafes and that sort of thing. And she is the height of fashion in Berlin at this time. Um, it was the first time when you had very, very short hair for a woman. And when it came over to the channel, it was called the Eaton Crop. And also, it was that 1926 was the first year when dresses went over the knee. But I love the little detail of one of her stockings, like unraveling there. And her monocle, I mean, it's just great, isn't it? And, and in Berlin at this time, between the wars, was this kind of center of, you know, experimentation and decadence and lots of, you know, they were questioning, you know, gender stereotypes. You know, it's, it's not all happening now. It was in 1926 in Berlin that they were looking at that. So, you know, she's very masculine, but she's, you know, obviously a woman. And showing her huge, great hands, and she's smoking, and she's drinking a spritzer. And even her cigarette box is lined with red, with red-tipped filters there. So it's all red, red and black check dress and a carmine pink background and then crimson lipstick. And then the, the figure on the, on the right, it's more of a sort of caricature in a way, uh, but she was a famous a kind of erotic dancer in Berlin at the same time called Anita Berber. And she was also a friend of Otto Dix. And, you know, you've got to be wearing this sort of, you know, dress um, in that way. He's actually signed his name in the, as a coiled serpent in this one, which links in with, you know, the kind of the woman, the fallen, the, the fallen Eve. So he, Otto Dix was fascinated in ugliness, if you like. He wasn't interested in beauty. He thought that was very sort of superficial. He was interested in, yeah, ugliness and what lay beneath the surface, etc. This is my intermezzo, <laughs> or my kind of palate cleanser between courses. And it, uh, also, it's just to remind you when we go into the next slide of the power of red, and that the way we look at color is totally dependent on context. Um, if any of you here are, are painters, you know exactly what I mean. So you might decide when you're making your painting, oh, I need to mix up a red to put in this particular part of the picture. But when you put that red, you move that red from your palette onto your painting, 
it doesn't look like the right red anymore. It doesn't look like the red that you had on your palette because the red that you put on your canvas is next to a gray or a, sh a shady, a particular green or a pink or it's changed the way we perceive color. So that is essential thing about color. The way we see it is dependent upon all the other colors around it. And I'm sure those of you who you know, decorate your homes, you, you get this again and again, that when you move things around in your home, they look different because of the colors. The colors will look different because of where they are adjacent to other colors. So one of the, 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 the art, there was an American art, well, German born, but lived a lot in America, called Joseph Albers. This image is by him. He became a kind of leading teacher in art in Germany at the, at the Bauhaus. And then when the Bauhaus was closed down by the Nazis, he then moved to America, where he became a pioneering teacher at a place called Black Mountain College. And he taught all about color. It was his whole thing was about color context. And it's a, it's a system that is taught in art schools today. Um, so it had a big impact. And so I'm just showing you, he did a whole series about squares. So I'm just going to put them every now and again. I'm going to beam one up and just have a kind of re refresh your eyes before I move on to the next image. Well, I think one of the um, great artists in the 20th century of children is a Scottish artist called Joan Erdley. And she's very well known in Scotland, but not so well known down south. And these are two pictures by her um, from Glasgow, because a lot of her life was spent in Glasgow. Uh, the one on the left is just called Little Girl with a Squint from 1962. And her studio was in the Townhead area of Glasgow, which is a kind of slum area. And she used to love drawing and painting the children there. And so here, in this, the one on the left, this is an oil painting. And you know, she's quite a nervous, shy little girl. She's sucking her fingers because she's sort of being watched. Um, but she's obviously quite kind of vibrant as well. And she's got this lovely red cardigan. Her hair is sort of tied up. Maybe she's even got a little red hat on, orange hat on. And then she's, Joan Erdley has placed her, you know, behind or rather in front of all this kind of messy graffiti wall and a bit of old newspaper stuck, a poster still stuck on the, the wall behind. And the actual technique, it's very kind of rough and coarse but still there is a sensitivity and an empathy um, for her subject. And then on the one on the right, that's a pastel drawing of Patton Ann Sampson, who she often did pictures of. And they're two little sisters, and you can see you know, the difference in personality matches their clothing co colors. So the one on the left, you know, she's obviously quite extrovert with her orange hair and her red dress and pink cardigan, whereas her sister is much more shy and reserved. So I'll just tell you what Joan Erdley said about the children who would knock on her door and ask to be painted. There are always knocks on the door. The ones I want, I try to get them to stand still. I watch them moving about and do the best I can. The Sampsons, they do amuse me. They are full of what's going on today, who's broken into what shop, and who's flung a pie in whose face. It goes on and on. They just let out all their life and energy. And I watch them, and I do try and think about them in painterly terms. All the bits of red and bits of colour, and they wear each other's clothes. They are Glasgow, this richness that Glasgow has. I mean, tragically, Joan Erdley, she died in her early 40s, um, but she's well worth looking out for if you don't know her already. So now to some male uh, portraits. So this is Edward, Prince of Wales, by Hans Holbein, who was the court painter to Henry VIII. And this was painted in 1538. And at last, he's had his son, his heir, by his third wife, Jane Seymour. And this painting was uh, commissioned to give to Henry VIII to celebrate his son's first birthday. And so, of course, red for royalty. And although he's only one year old, he's already sort of got the royal wave, hasn't he? <laughs> and he's holding his rattle as if it, it's as if it's the monarch scepter already. So it's a very sort of powerful image. Unfortunately, it's in the National Gallery in Washington, which is a right shame, isn't it? So the picture on the left is by El Greco, and it's the disrobing of Christ from 1577. 
It's a massive painting. It's three metres high. And it's in the sacristy of Toledo Cathedral. Because after he'd, he, you know, as I said yesterday, or the day before, he, tr he came from Crete, then he moved to Venice and was a pupil of Titian, and then he moved to Spain. And he spent most of his life in Spain. So the disrobing of Christ. So imagine, you know, going into this vast cathedral with no electricity, just flickering candlelight. And you'd look up in the darkness with a bit of sort of flickering light, and you'd look up and you'd see this vast picture, three metre high, and uh, you'd be pretty impressed. Um, and of course, because, because you're looking up at it, you know, he, he, and to make, the, you know, and in, the, in a way, in the kind of subdued light as well, he's made this great kind of pillar of fiery red for the, for the robe, and he hasn't bothered with lots of sort of subtle shades. There's just only about three shades, and that's it. Um, it's just about the power, isn't it, of that red. And then you have that contrast with the kind of serenity of his face and his gesture with his hands as well. Uh, you've got the kind of brutal man to the right of him here, the brutish face here, who's, who's undoing the bound hands before he's going to be hammered into the cross here. And you've got all the sort of mob behind him, lots of different faces. I'll just, this one's rather lovely. He's looking at, looking at us and pointing at Christ, you know, sort of letting, getting us to join in the mockery, basically. And then down here, you've got what's called the Three Marys. And so I can never quite remember who the third one is. Oh, yeah, it's Mary Mother, Mary Magdalene, and Mary of Klopos. And anyway, apparently, the three Marys are only mentioned in one gospel, the Gospel of St. John. It, it's not mentioned in the other gospel. There were three of them. And when he came to deliver this massive painting to the authorities, they objected to this, that there shouldn't be three Marys, there only be two. And also, they didn't like the fact that the crowd head was higher than Christ. Nobody's head should be higher than Christ. So they insisted that he make alterations. But I mean, you know, to make an alteration to that would, you know, terrible thing to have to do. And he, he refused. So instead of getting his agreed 950 ducats, he only got 350 ducats for the picture uh, instead. But, but the painting became so popular, there are actually 17 versions of this painting. Two of them are known to be by El Greco, and the others are probably by assistants, and he might have come and done the hands and the faces and left everything else to the assistants. The painting on the right is of Cardinal Henry Newman by John Everett Millet, who painted that picture I showed you of the two blind girls, with the, sorry, the, the two sisters with the blind girl and the double rainbow. So he painted, he painted beautiful portraits as well. And this is from 1881. And because he's a cardinal, he's wearing his red robe and his red hat. And his, his hat is just sitting on his knees there. And so, of course, all cardinals wear red in homage to Christ, the sacrifice that Christ made, and also to sort of encourage them that they, if they had as much faith as he did, that they would be prepared to die for their, for their faith. So in this image, Unlike the El Greco, he's, he's broken up the surface of that material into lots of individual brush strokes following the contour of the body, and there's quite a few different shades within that area of light, lights and darks and in between reds as well. His elderly hands just rest on his lap there, and then you've got the lace work sort of falling away um, from his knees there, and he looks out at us with this very, very benign expression on his face. So with, with um, Cardinal Newman, he founded the Birmingham Oratory, and he'd actually converted to Catholicism. And then, actually, in 2009, uh, it was agreed that he should be a saint, and he was beatified. So he's now Saint Henry Newman. Well, I put this picture in yesterday, two days ago, uh, but I just want to put in it again because of this wonderful use of red and gold, and then the effect of the after image. So you put the green around the red um, to, to highlight the intensity of the red.
but also in relation to Grunewald. Apparently, when he died, his studio was full of lots and lots of different synthetic pigments. So when I say synthetic, they're pigments that he has made through various sort of chemical procedures. And art historians think that he may well have been very interested in alchemy. And they relate you know, some of the imagery, because of the imagery that he uses, which is quite unique, and also all these sort of ingredients that he was making all these, his own pigments. And just very briefly, I think it's an interest in relation to red, but in alchemy, uh, the whole point of alchemy is not just, on a material level, it's about making lead into gold, but on a spiritual level, it's about the purification of the human spirit and the quest for the philosopher's stone, and Christ is the philosopher's stone. And Christ needs to be represented in red, and if you're an alchemist and you're making your own red pigment, you mix together mercury and sulfur. And sulfur is yellow, and mercury is red, and you create this, out of this combination of mercury and sulfur, you create this a wonderful red pigment. And mercury is related to the spirit, and sulfur is the soul. And so if you mix these together, if you create a perfect vermilion, you are really, it's about creating this perfect marriage between spirit, soul, and matter. And so Christ is the per perfection of the perfect balance of pure spirit, pure soul, pure body. So that's another little detour, but I think it is quite, quite interesting. And Christ is called the, the red gold king. So it's a combination of the red and gold. So to show you a, a contemporary artist um, making a, a, a painting derived from the crucifixion and resurrection is Norman Adams, who was a Royal Academician. Uh, he died in 2005, and this is called Requiem for a Dying God. Uh, most of his paintings are watercolours, and some of them are very big for watercolours. This is a metre and a half across. He actually described himself as a freelance agnostic, uh, but he did do a lot of, lot of religious Christian paintings. So in this image, you know, he's reduced it down to kind of very abstract image. You, just, you have the simplicity of the cross. Instead of uh, a spectrum rainbow, you've got a black rainbow. And you have kind of planets and stars and a pattern of red crosses scattered all the way across and in front of the black cross bringing together you know, the, the crucifixion and the hope of resurrection. Well, Andy Goldsworthy, he, he works entirely out in the landscape. He doesn't use you know, paint squeezed out of tubes. His materials are always things that he finds in nature. It might be stones and rocks, or it may well be rowan leaves. So they're entirely ephemeral pieces of art, and they're recorded just by him taking a photograph, which is then exhibited in the galleries. He's a very popular artist, and um, this particular piece is just called Rowan Leaves, 25th of October, 1987. And alongside the photo is a simple text written by him. It just says, Rowan leaves laid around whole, collecting the last few leaves, nearly finished, Dog ran into hole, started again, made in the shade on a windy, sunny day. Sculpture Yorkshire Park. <laughs> but what I love about this image is it's sort of so simple, and yet it's a sort of cosmic image as well. You know, it's like a giant sun with a kind of black hole in the middle that you kind of disappear into. And he's just beautifully you know, graded the different shades of leaves, of the autumnal rowan, rowan leaves there. So his work's all about kind of art about, you know, reminding us of the, the danger of what we're doing to our planet. So he says, he says, nature goes beyond what is called countryside. Everything comes from the earth. What is important to me is that at the heart of whatever I do are a growing understanding and a sharpening perception of the land.
Red is also associated with violence, and here we have sexual violence, and it's a painting by Titian. It's called Tarquin and Lucretia from, 70, from 1571. It's just under two meters high, and it's in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And for many, many years, until about 18 months ago, I lived in Cambridge, so I know this painting extremely well. And it's a, you know, what an extraordinary subject to paint, a hideous subject. And he, paint, he painted it when he was probably 90 years old, which is quite an extraordinary thing to do. And I mean, also to have the energy at that age to make a massive painting like this. And he did say that it was an invention involving greater labor and artifice than anything perhaps that I have produced in many years. Well, it's, it's one of these stories um, about ancient, the ancient Rome and which, which is about this kind of brutal man, Tarquin, who breaks into a young woman's bedroom. She's called Lucretia. She's a, a married noblewoman. And he rapes her. And she's putting up a kind of desperate fight there with this massive sort of tree trunk of an arm to try and stop him. And uh, anyway, she, she doesn't succeed and she's raped. And then she writes a note, uh, a letter to her husband and her father telling them what happened. And she takes her own life. So it's a hideous story. But with, with artists at this time, you know, you, were quite, you had quite limited subject matter. You had portraits. You didn't have landscape at this time. Um, and you had Christian stories. But besides that, you could paint Greek myth and Roman legend, which was wonderful because it kind of liberated your imagination. And you could, it's all about human psychology, but on a rather an exaggerated level. And so one of the great source materials for artists is a book written by Ovid, the Roman poet, called Metamorphosis. And this is one of the stories from Metamorphosis. So in an image like this for sexual violence, you know, you've got to have red. So he's got this kind of carmine red breeches and then vermilion um, stockings. And one of them is unraveling because he's kind of out of control. And the servant boy on the left is kind of, you know, surprised them. He, he pulls the curtain back to see what's going on. This is called The Death of Major Pearson, the 6th of January, 1781, Jersey. And it's painted by John Singleton Copley in 1783. And it's in the Tate Britain. And it's a two and a half meter cross painting, huge picture. And it commemorates a real event when the French invaded Jersey. And the islanders surrendered to the French. But the young garrison commander called Major Pearson, he led a counterattack, which was ultimately successful. As you can see here, the raising of the British ensign. But beneath the ensign, the other officers are now lowering to the ground uh, Major Pearson, who's been you know, fatally shot by a French sniper. And so he's the hero of the day, of course. And apparently he actually died quite some time before the moment of victory down some back alley, but that wouldn't have gone for an heroic image, would it? You know, these paintings are to stir the hearts of the British public over our great enemy, the French. And so he is a great, you know, and he obviously was a hero as well. But so, and in this image, if you were looking at it in, in, in England at this time, and you're a well-educated, you know, cultured person, you would have immediately drawn parallels with paintings by Renaissance and Baroque artists of the deposition of Christ, luring Christ from the cross. That is this, but in you know, Protestant Britain, you would not have done a crucifixion painting, uh, but you might allude to it in your history painting such as this. So here we have the British redcoats, and it's extraordinary now to think of, you know, going into battle wearing bright red. <laughs> it just shows you how different, you know, the attitudes to warfare are now compared to those times. I mean, the only thing I can think of is that, well, for a start, red would, you know, scare your enemy. And also it would disguise your blood when you, you know, next to somebody who's just been mortally, <coughs> terribly wounded. Um, but so, you know, with this color, most of the time it would have been quite faded, a kind of pale pink or pale kind of orangey color. 
because it wasn't a really, you know, they used quite a cheap dye made from the root of the madder plant. And this colour was called Stroud Water Scarlet because the material, the broadcloth, was woven and dyed in a town in Gloucestershire called Stroud. And today there's still one remaining company who makes the guardsmen's uniforms today called Stroud Millican Uniforms. So they've been there for hundreds of years. <laughs> This is a painting by the German artist George Gross, contemporary of Otto Dix, and it's called Metropolis from 1916. So it's painted right at the heart, in the middle of the First World War. And a lot of, and it's Berlin. And a lot of artists at this time in other European countries are painting pictures of the city. These, this new phenomena, these vast great cities full of you know, people from coming from all different parts of the country, mixing together different classes, things for sale, factories, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, trains and trams. You know, it was an incredibly kind of exciting place to be if you're an artist anyway, such as George Gross. And that's what he's tried to express in this painting. So he's using the red to express all that kind of energy and, and kind of danger as well, if you like, in the city. And it's quite a kind of chaotic picture to express the movement and the chaos of, of life in the, in the city. So there's lots of different people. Um, you have to sort of focus in on individual people to kind of get a sense of how it's been kind of held together. So it's all very fragmented. So he's an artist who's influenced by Cubism and, and Futurism um, from Italy as well. He was one of the artists... Uh, who, when the Nazis came along, was deemed de degenerate, as was Otto Dix. So when the Nazis came along, they only promoted art that um, you know, portrayed the perfect Aryan specimen, a kind of athlete or a, a, a buxom blonde. And they got to get they, a lot of these artists who we all revere today, uh, they all lost their teaching jobs, all their work was taken, confiscated off the museum walls, they were banned from painting, and then there was the Degenerate Art Exhibition of, of 1937 in Munich, uh, where their work was displayed. And uh, in, the, in the museum down the road was the Great German Art Exhibition, which had all these you know, ghastly sort of athletes and warriors in it. And nobody knows any of those artists anymore. <laughs> uh, um, and apparently many more people went to the Degenerate Art Exhibition than they did to the, the Great German Art Exhibition. So George Gross was, was, had a lot of paintings um, in that exhibition. So another uh, uh, painting read for violence is The Riot by the English artist Edward Burra from 1948, and, and he specialised in watercolour. He was horribly crippled with, with arthritis and couldn't stand at an easel and couldn't use you know, quite heavy oil brushes, so watercolour suited him. And he, he went to Dublin and he experienced a riot. So back in London, he made this watercolour out of his imagination. And I think that I love that, that combination of the blue, the blue with the red. It creates quite a kind of haunting effect rather than just using black. So you've got these people who are on the brink of breaking out into a kind of horrible violence. They're right on the edge of it, holding these flares. And then in the background, the yellow are the lights from shops in the background there. <coughs> So Edward Burra, he was born in 19, 1905 from Rye in Sussex. He went to the Royal College and he died in 1976. Oh, I forgot. This is one of my own paintings. Uh, <laughs> I forgot I had this in. So, as I said, I used to live in Cambridge and this was the painting I did when I left Cambridge. It was my last picture. It could be any street in England, really doesn't have to be Cambridge. Um, but what struck me about this street, it's just an ordinary kind of Victorian street, was the telegraph pole, with all the wires going to all the houses. And it just, it's sort of a portrait of that, really. And it just made me think of all the networks that we all have that make us feel grounded and we are a particular person through our relationships. 
and I wanted to use a sort of pinky, pinky colour for the sky with these quite kind of dark, rather ominous clouds radiating from the telegraph pole and the cyclist coming towards us. So this painting by Matisse, it's become a real icon of modernism, the Red Studio from 1911 in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And the reason why it's such an icon is because it challenges all the rules that artists had, had abided by and um, for hundreds of years since the beginning of the Renaissance. And one of the big rules uh, was that you create an illusionistic space. You don't create flat images. You, create, you show your skills at creating space and depth and three-dimensionalness to the forms. Well, he's saying, no, I'm going to make a completely flat picture with a little bit of playing on perspective as well. And the main thing in this picture is the colour. The subject of this picture is the red. And the objects themselves are very two-dimensional. So there is a sense of space because he puts, the, he puts this picture at the angle. So you have the angle, the edge of the room, the corner of the room. But he then doesn't carry the line on. That's completely all one plane there. And there does appear to be a window, but there's no light coming in. There's no shadows. There's no highlights. None of these forms have shadows on them at all. And interestingly, there's a clock, and the clock doesn't have hands on it. It's a sort of timeless image, which ties in with the fact that there's no shadows and there's no highlights. So it's all about the intensity of the red. That's what this picture is all, all, all about. And this is a painting that's of an artist called Roderick Barrett, and it's called Hauntings, Hauntings. And he's haunted by Matisse's paintings. He's obsessed with Matisse, and also with the paintings of Chardin as well. And Roderick Barrett, he made this in 1987. He was an elderly man by then, and he's really sort of looking back over his life, I think. And he's thinking about his own kind of mortality. And so it's obviously an echo to the homage to the Red Studio. He's placed himself right at the back of the picture. Here he is, working on a little self-portrait, sitting on his bed. And this nude references Matisse, whereas this still life with the skull and the coffee pot is a reference to Chardin, a French artist who did lots of those paintings. And then walking across the room is this curious figure of a man and his bicycle with a tray of, these are candles, unlit candles. So I sort of see that as a kind of image of death. Uh, and that one day he'll, you know, a candle will be lit for him, for his soul when he dies. And the ladder is an archetypal symbol of, you know, is there an afterlife or not? There is an opening in the room, and there doesn't appear to be a ceiling either. So it's all sort of, it's kind of very poetic image. And then on the left, you've got this girl tossing up feathers into the air and catching, catching them. I mean, I don't know what that means. I mean, it could be an image of fate or just chance or, you know, it's, it's up to us. This is my take on it. And then I like the way he brings us right down to earth with a bucket in the, in the foreground. So he's probably got a leaky roof in his, in his studio there. <coughs> it's also very well constructed. You've got these sort of parallels going across the picture, the placing of the forms. And that's what he was obsessed with in regards to Matisse, the kind of creation of sense of harmony with different objects placed across the canvas. This is called Reflections. What does your soul look like? And it's by the Scottish artist Peter Doig from 1996. He's a very well-known artist in Britain. And um, anyway, he, yeah, so he's a highly regarded artist. He had a big, re big retrospective at Tate Britain quite a few years ago. He's born in Edinburgh in, in 1959. And the background of this picture is that he and his brother were staying in, were staying in Canada. They were near a... a, a by a lake near Toronto, it was in the winter. 
and the lake was frozen over. And he got his brother to go and stand on the ice, and he then went and got some buckets of hot water and threw it over the ice. And he then took some photographs of it, and then he made the painting. And I just think it's a great image. Um, I like the way it's just made up of these sort of horizontal bars with then the vertical stripes. So in the foreground, you've just got that narrow hor horizontal line of the ice in the foreground. Then you have all the verticals of the red tree trunks and the red shadow with a few bits of ice. And then you've just got the top with his black jeans and black boots. So he, you know, most people wouldn't have thought of just cutting the figure off. <laughs> they would have painted the whole figure. And it's curious the way he's looking away from his own shadow. He's not looking at the shadow, it's us who are looking at the shadow, which I think is quite interesting. So this is the way he's being perceived anyway, as a very sort of red, a red shadow. So a red reflection. This is called I and the Village, and it's by the Russian artist Mark Chagall. He was born Moshe Chagall, comes from a very orthodox Jewish family from Western Russia, but when he emigrated to France, he sort of francophiled his name, <coughs> so Mark Chagall. So it's called I and the Village, 1911, Museum of Modern Art, New York. So it's really a celebration of life back in his, home, his hometown, really, a peasant life in Russia. And you've got these two profiles. You've got the, the lamb, so the sacrificial lamb for purification in Jewish culture. And he's looking called eyeball to eyeball at the Russian peasant, very green, very earthy face, and who's offering a kind of a present to the sheep for his sacrifice. And then there are little vignettes. So in the head of the, the, the sheep or the lamb is an image of a woman milking a cow. And then between the two foreheads, you've got the reaper and the, it's an upside down woman scattering the, the seed. So you've got the cycles of nature there. And then you've just got the town uh, at the top there. And you've got this lovely kind of center of the bright, the pure red against the, the green of the, of the profile there. And then the red goes into soft pinks as he brings in the white and the blue as well, so into purples and blues. And the whole structure of the picture radiates out from the center here. And it's all based upon segments of a circle Wherever you look, you'll see it. So he's creating that harmony um, through the repetition of that particular shape and holds the images together within that structure. There's no separation. There's no sort of separation between foreground, middle ground, background. They're pretty much on the same plane. There's that kind of unity, uh, which is part of what com comes out of Cubism. And the symbols, they're not they're quite ambiguous. I mean, I, I just give you my interpretation of it, um, but they're not laid down. They're not signs. They are quite open-ended. So with Marc Chagall, he's often described as a painter of love because he did lots of pictures of him and his wife. But also he does pictures of love that embrace all mankind. And although a Jewish artist he felt that the, the cross was a symbol shared by all descendants of the Jewish Jesus. So he's in Chichester Cathedral in Britain. There are these wonderful stained glass windows all by Marc Chagall. Uh, and then there's a lovely little church near Tunbridge Wells where he did an entire collection of stained glass windows. I'll just read you a quote from him. In love lies true art. That is my technique and my religion the new and old religion handed down to us from times long past. Are not painting and colour inspired by love? In our life there is a single colour, as on an artist's palette, which provides the meaning of life and art. It is the colour 
of love. And interestingly, in Russian, um, the word for red is the same word for beauty. It's krasny. So in Russian culture, red has you know, great significance. So you've got you know, red square, the red revolution, um, the red army. And in Russian icons, you get a lot of red uh, in them. And also, if you're an Orthodox Russian, in one of your rooms you, where you have your icon, it's called the red corner, where you display your icon. It's always in the corner of a room. It's never on the front of a wall. It's always at the corner. And that's what it's called, the red corner. Well, another Russian artist, Kandinsky, was fascinated in colour and the meaning of shapes and creating his new abstract language. He's one of the pioneers of abstraction. Uh, he, originally, he originally trains to be a lawyer, and it's only when he's about 30 that he actually becomes an artist and he moves to Munich. But with the outbreak of the First World War, he then returns to Russia, lives through the Russian Revolution, and then moves back to, back to Germany again. And he's a great teacher at the Bauhaus. So this is called Red Spot Number Two from 1921. And of course, obviously entirely abstract. So you have this kind of pulsating red spot with different kind of shapes coming from it or radiate going towards it, pulling away, pushing, push and pull. Um, you have very strong colors, no kind of subtle mid-tones. You have a curious kind of outer shape with the edges cut off. And then these kind of white and white and black kind of spears and kind of egg-like shapes on the, on the left-hand corner. So he wrote a book called Concerning the Spiritual in Art, published in 1911. And for him, the development of an abstract language was about trying to find some sort of universal language that expressed feelings of spirituality and peace. I'll just read you what he says about the color red. The unbounded warmth of red has not the irresponsible appeal of yellow, but rings inwardly with a determined and powerful intensity it glows in itself, maturely, but does not distribute its vigor aimlessly. The varied powers of red are very striking. Light warm red has a certain similarity to medium yellow, alike in its texture and appeal, and gives a feeling of strength, vigor, and determination, of triumph. In music, it is a sound of trumpets, strong, harsh, and ringing, Vermilion is a red with a feeling of sharpness, like glowing steel, which can be cooled by water. Vermilion is quenched by blue, for it can support no mixture with a cold colour. Well, he goes on along like that, about every colour. So I think it's really interesting. If, you're, if you are interested in colour, go and read this book. And if you have a friend who's, got very, you know, who's blind or very short-sighted, you know, short read him a bit of that and like, give him a sense of, you know, or her, what, what red is. What does it feel like? What does it sound like? And with Kandinsky, he has synesthesia. So he was also a musician. He played the cello. And I'm sure having synesthesia probably helped him develop his abstract language because when he played music, he would see colours. And when he looked at colour, he would feel vibration. So I'm sure that helped him kind of move away from representational art into abstraction. And just to finish up with two, two more artists. So Mondrian, who evolves his work from the Russian constructivists and Kandinsky, he evolves a similar form of abstract art. But with, with, with Mondrian, it, you can really see quite, you know, how he evolved from almost impressionistic and fauvist sort of work into his total pure abstract work. And here is an you know, obvious example. So here is one of his paintings of a tree. And by doing these tree pictures, he reduces it down to just the horizontal and the vertical. And then it's just the three primaries and black and white. You can't have a diagonal because that disturbs the equilibrium. So there's never a diagonal, there's never a curve.
And then the final image, uh, on the left, you've got a painting by Lucio Fontana, and it's called Spatial Concept from 1968. And he's one of the kind of early conceptual artists, if you like, who started to do things like putting a knife through the middle of his canvas. That's what he's done there. And it's all about saying, in a way, I, I'm now going to make art. I'm gonna, I can use any, I can do anything and call it art. It doesn't have to be about creating an illusion on a flat, cam, on a flat surface, creating an illusion of depth. I can create depth by literally making a slit. So you have the, the dark shadow behind. So it looks as if it's just going right back in space. And you just have the blank, you know, pure, just pure red um, all the way all the way across the canvas. And I mean, his work is really interesting in terms of art history, I think, and how art evolves, the story of art um, through modernism to today's work. And he had a big influence on the development and conceptual art. And the artist on the, on the right is called Nelson Lerner, and he's a Brazilian artist, and it's called Homage to Fontana. So it's a homage to this artist. And it's a sort of joke picture. It's a, it's a witty painting, and he's kind of debunking the kind of grandeur uh, of the artist, the mystique of the artist, and the art of the grandeur of the artwork, and all this sort of thing. And so he's now putting zips in, and instead of using you know very expensive canvas, it's just cotton, and he's put the, sewn the zips in, and just has a it kind of folded folded over like that. Uh, I just think it's a really witty, a witty image. So it's kind of you know, part of the pop art movement is Nelson Lerner. So it's demystifying the role of art and the grandeur of art, if you like, which really comes out through pop art. So that's the, the final image, the last image. And I'm going to go back through them like I did last time, just to <coughs> remind you of the story I've been telling, uh, the story of red in art. <coughs> 